Okay, we are now recording. Let's go from the current slide. And before we get going on that, let me make these few announcements. A couple of them are pretty important. Okay? Um, are any of you ever on the Birmingham campus? Did I tell you this about the Leon Kennedy? Okay. Anyone have a question about that? Leon Kennedy Student Center is now closed. Uh, I guess they're going to renovate that at some point, but everything that was in there, I assume, has moved across to the new Academic Success Building. Uh, that's the cafeteria, the bookstore, I assume, the Space Center, I assume, and it probably even the police department. I assume they've moved too because they said the building's closed. So, don't go there anymore. All right. Now the next thing is the academic. I mean the administrative calendar. Now there's nothing too incredible on here. There is one thing next week, but there's actually two things next week. And I think I announced this before, but in case anyone wasn't here, I'm pretty sure it was a Freudian slip. But way back early in the term, they told us we had a professional development day down in Montgomery. All full-time instructors coming up this month, and I tried to forget it, but someone reminded me of it this week, and sure enough, next Wednesday, if you have are in a class with a full-time instructor, check with them on Monday to see if you're having class on Wednesday, because if uh, we all are technically supposed to go, but I'm hoping they'll let us instructors who have many term courses uh, stay and teach those courses because to lose one day of class is to lose a whole week of class in a regular term. That's too much, but they may still require them to go. Check with your instructor because if, if that instructor has to stay for a mini term, they'll be here for your classes too. But if you've got an adjunct instructor, those classes are continuing. They're not canceled, but check with your instructor on Monday to see if you're having class on Wednesday. Only full-time instructors are required to go down to the meeting, and it's an all-day affair. I mean, I think it starts something around 10, but that allows us travel time down there, and then it ends around 3 or so, but that allows us travel time back. By that time, the day's over, basically. I was going to try to squeeze in my evening class, but I talked with them last night, and they said, don't bother. <coughs> I've got it recorded, so I'm just going to let them view the recording. Okay. Now, the next one does affect this class big time, totally. Next Thursday, mm -hmm. one week from today, the, ten, the 11th, is, human, uh, is, is Honors and Awards Day. That's in the Arthur Shores Building, which is also the gymnasium on the Birmingham West Campus. It starts at 10 o'clock. Okay, and we're required to be there. So, I will not be here next Thursday at 10 o'clock. I'll be out there, over there, at 10 o'clock next Thursday. It's going to go at least an hour, probably closer to two hours, so I probably won't be back here until 12 at the earliest, possibly 12.30. So I don't, it may even mess with my next class. Uh, so I'll work that out with them. Uh, hopefully I'll be back in time for my 115 class. So we'll, that won't be an issue, I don't think. Okay, but anyway, that's next Thursday, no class. Now, the question is, uh, it's not your fault, it's not my fault, it's the school scheduling. Do you want to try to make that up somehow, uh, or just count it as a missed class? We're near the end of the term. We are soon going to be, in, today going to be in chapter 6, that's the last chapter we're going to do. I think we can probably squeeze in enough, but if you want, because you paid for it, you want that other day, we can try to make up the class somehow. What, what's your feeling on it? Be honest. No? All right. Y'all are eager to watch it. Okay. So, that's next Thursday. We'll meet Tuesday. We won't be meeting Thursday. Now, this is one. You'll see a few posters around. Now, we're in on a couple of different NASA things, so don't get them confused. The NCAS is the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars Program. That's, you see a little blurb on it there. There's not any information there, just a little blurb. There's a poster, I think, on one of these walls really close here. 
I think that deals with this. Okay? Uh, I've got a flyer here, and if any of you need to see these websites, uh, it's basically gonasa.gov. That's it, gonasa.gov, and then there's a couple of places you can go within that. So if you want to see this, feel free to come and pick it up. Okay? It's a great program. The deadline for the program starts next fall. The deadline for application is May 15th. So you have a little over six, uh, right around six weeks to get that done. Okay? But get started on it now. It's a great program. We've had several students from Lawson participate in the past, and they have loved it. I think they actually sometimes get to interact with real NASA programs, you know, space flight, satellites, you know, uh, rovers, you know, various things. They get to interact with them uh, at least in a close to tangible way. Okay. So take advantage of it. It's a great program. And they pay you. Okay. So it's not a free. Okay. Any questions, either administratively or trigonometrical really okay all right now we were getting ready to do example nine and yeah here's a place we could do it where example seven was okay let me get my pen set up okay and this also, by the way, is at LarsonPreCalculus.com. You can see an interactive version of this type of an example and interact with that version. So it says, solve this, solve sine of 5x plus sine of 3x equals 0. That's an equation, so we need to solve this. All right. When you would ever run into an equation like this, I'm not sure, but if you ever did, you know how to go now. Now, this is not one of those uh, identities that you, I use enough that I even bother remembering, okay? Uh, it's just right about this place in the book. That's about the only place I ever have had need to do it that I recall. Okay, so what I'll do is flip back one page. If you don't have your book, I'll flip back a cup. no, flip ahead. A slide or two there so which one of these looks most like that sine 5x plus sine 3x well go back here and look and there it's a very top one isn't it that's sine u plus sine v what is that it's 2 times the average of those two times the sine of the average of those two uh, times the cosine of the difference of those two okay so if we can remember that a uh, half the difference of those two sorry about that the, the sum divided by two uh, so let's go back all right so what did we find out that was y'all got it down you put it in your memory banks what was it two times sine of Okay, so that would be 5x plus 3x divided by 2 times the cosine of 5x minus 3x divided by 2. Okay, so this will be, and that's equal to 0. Okay, 2 times the sine of what? Anybody? 4x. Okay. 5x plus 3x is 8x. Divided by 2 is 4x. Times the cosine of x. Okay. And that's equal to 0. Okay. Well. Oh. I'm leaving something out, am I not? No, I'm not. I guess I'm okay. 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 Now, these are all multiplied by each other, right? So that's three factors. I'll, in fact, I think I'll just go on and take out these grouping symbols because they're not really helping us anyway. So making it look like those are more special than the other. And guess what? Since this is an equation, we can divide by two. 
done. Okay, got rid of the two. Okay, so we either have, and they didn't give us any limits on it, if I my memory's right. Nope. Okay, so what we do, don't have a general solution here. We need the places where sine of 4x is equal to 0. What would 4x be? 4x is either going to be... <coughs> Maybe I should have done this. So either sine of 4x equals 0 or cosine x equals 0. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. What values of 4x would make sine equal 0? Where is sine 0? Anybody? Second? Little up. Okay, the cosines are zero at half pi, the sines are zero at your whole pi, exactly. Okay? Now, normally we'd say two pi, but you see sine is zero at zero pi, two pi, three pi. It repeats every two pi, but it's a zero every pi. So this will be n pi. Okay? Any n integer pi. What makes x equal to n pi over 4, or pi fourths n, or however you want to say it, n pi over 4. Okay, now, Seth was looking ahead in his crystal ball about what, when is cosine 0? At the half pi's. Every half pi, because it's 0, this one and that one, even though the uh, this period is 2 pi, it's every, so that would be uh, x equal uh, pi halves plus n pi. Every n pi from there on. Okay. And that's all she wrote. Okay. They didn't give us a limit of it, so that should be our solution. Uh, oh, and then at the end they say the solution on the interval from 0 to 2 pi so from 0 to 2 pi, they didn't give us this in the problem, but they said at the end, what would be these values? Certainly 0 qualifies, right? And then the first n pi here would be pi fourths. The second one would be pi halves, and that's covered in both of these, so pi halves. Okay, the next n pi would be 3 fourths pi. Okay, the next one would be 4 fourths pi or uh, pi. The next one would be 5 fourths pi. And then 6 fourths, five fourths pi would be 3 halves pi. And the next one would be 7 fourths pi. And the next one would be 2 pi, but 2 pi is not included because of the parentheses. Does that make sense? So basically, it's every quarter pi is between 0 and 2 pi, but not counting 2 pi. All right, let's make sure that's what we got. 0, pi fourth, pi has, 3 fourth pi, pi, 5 fourth pi, 3 has pi, and 7 fourth pi. Yes. Now, they show the... Uh, graph of this and you'll see uh, sure enough that's what it is but now for the graph of it they didn't do this one they probably did the top one either one you'll get you'll see they both work all right there is a checkpoint following that so please do the checkpoint soon after class to sort of cement it in your head so that you've got that down now, as, as if that wasn't an application, the next thing we're going to do are applications, okay? And these will be a little more real-life-ish, not just solving a problem. Okay, <clears throat> ignoring air resistance, which is usually not a bad, not a good thing to do, because it's always there, the range of a projectile fired at an angle theta with the horizontal, angle theta with the horizontal, and with an initial velocity of v sub zero feet per second is given by this. This is the 
range R is 1 16th <coughs> these are 0 squared times the sine theta times cosine theta. All right. Now, where does, you might ask yourself where does the 16 come from? I won't go into gory detail, I'll just tell you because we're in feet per second squared. Feet per second is the velocity, and we're going to look for it at the range in feet. 32 feet per second squared is the acceleration due to gravity in the uh, U.S. customary system, which is feet per second. So the 16 is a half of that. Now, not real clear why it's in the denominator, but we won't go there. That's why it's there. If you were dealing with meters per second, that would not be a 16. The progressive part would be okay. I think that would be a 4.9, because that would be what you would use in meters per second. But anyway, where R is a horizontal distance in feet, and that's a projectile travel. So it says nothing about the vertical, only how far, what's the range in feet. Now, if you don't take into account air resistance, you're going to fall short of your target. But we're not worrying about that now. This is ignoring air resistance. Okay? With that given, uh, it says, huh. Oh, yeah, okay, here we have it. Um, okay. This is in the middle of the same paragraph here. But a football player can kick a football from ground level with an initial velocity of 80 feet per second. So if we go back, that was our V0 right there. Okay, so V0 is 80 feet per second. Now, in uh, the trick class I had last fall, I had a place kicker in here in high school. Uh, he's in the calculus class now. Uh, didn't ask him how what his velocity was, but I doubt if it's quite that high, but we'll see. Okay. Rewrite the projectile motion model in terms of the first power of sine of a multiple angle. So basically what they're asking us to do, whether you had a football player or not, it says write the projectile model in a simpler form. So let's just go back to the model here. And here we have sine theta and cosine theta. In your book it says in terms of the first power of the sine of a multiple angle. Okay. What does that lead you to think? We want to get away from sine and cosine and get into sine, first power of sine of a multiple angle. Is there a demi that will do that for us? Anybody? First power of sine of a multiple angle. What's the simplest multiple angle you can think of right now? Not one. Double angle formula. And what does that get tell you? Okay, is two times sine theta cosine theta? Is that what you said? I can't. I can't hear well. Okay. Now, here we have just sine theta cosine theta. So let's divide both sides of this uh, by two to get it over here. Okay. So instead of sine theta cosine theta here, we're going to put one over two times sine of two theta. Sound like a winner? Okay. So let's do it that way then. That would be R is equal to, we got we already got a 16 in the denominator, now we're going to have a 32 in the denominator. V0 squared and just have sine of 2 theta. Agreed? All right, y'all are easy to convince, aren't you? Okay. You'll say yes to anything, won't you? Okay. All right, got it? So there's the first part. Write the projectile motion model in simpler form. So I'll write it down here too. That would be R is equal to 1 over 32 V naught squared sine 2 theta. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that's R. At what angle, so we're looking for a theta here, must the player kick the football so that the football travels 200 
feet. 200 feet is about 66 and a two-thirds yards, right? Right? Huh? <laughs> Y'all are easy on it. Now, if this was if this place cooker can kick at 67 yards, I think Nick wants to talk to him, okay? He needs to talk to him. Huh? I say he needs to talk to him. Yeah, he really does, doesn't he? <laughs> If he could kick it straight, that's the other thing. Okay, all right. All right, enough of that. Okay, so we're asking what angle? Well, how can we get that? What's your angle the 200 feet corresponds to? That's the range. Yeah, that's what we have here. So let's write it down. We have 200. I'm going to leave off the units, just hoping they've got them right for us. And we've got a 1 over 32 here. Our V0, remember, was 80. we got to square that. Anyone know what the square of 80 is? If I say so. Okay. 8 squared is 64, and then 10 squared is 100, so 6,400, right? All right, yeah, you'll buy anything. Okay. Now, that would be feet squared per second squared, but we don't have enough information to do the rest of it. So we'll just leave that, and we'll do sine of 2 theta. Oops, not 20. Theta, theta, theta. All right. Well, can we do that? Can we divide 32 into 6,400? Oh, that guy. 34 into 6,400? 32 into 6,400? Help me, somebody. <coughs> 200, okay. Now, that simplifies things. Let's divide both sides by 200 then. All right, that becomes 1, and this becomes sine of 2 theta. <coughs> now, we have a little bit of a problem here that we need to think through really carefully here. Uh, the angle theta. Okay, let's just start with 2 theta. At what angle 2 theta will the sine be equal to 1? Where is sine equal 1? At pi halves. So 2 theta is equal to pi halves. Now it's also 1 at minus 3 halves pi, isn't it? But that's somewhere behind them. I don't think Nick wants that guy. Okay, okay. So we won't do him, okay? Or it could be 5 halves pi. Add another 2 pi to that. Ooh. That's an angle somewhere, I don't think, well, that's actually back the same place. So we won't mess with that. We're going to keep it between 0 and pi, okay? So, if 2 theta is pi halves, what in the world is theta? Divide both sides by 2. And what do you get? Pi fourths. Okay, he'd better kick that thing at an angle of pi fourths. Now, a couple of issues with that. That's a fairly low trajectory. And maybe that's where Nick has been having some problems. If they don't get it quite high enough, it gets blocked, right? So, but that's the maximum trajectory, by the way. If you're a little closer than 67 feet away, of course, he's got to also clear uh, in your book. You'll see he has to clear the goalpost, so it's going to have to be closer than that. Uh, but the... Uh, a little bit closer, he can go a little bit higher and still get it over. And that way, less chance of getting blocked. But that's the angle you need. Okay. 45 degrees. Why they started out with pi force? Oh, they said or 45 degrees. Yeah, a lot of football players probably won't know what pi force are, would they? Okay. Never mind. I didn't say that. I thought. Okay. Oops, I bet you Seth was a football player, weren't you? No. Okay. You were a real football player, weren't you? I thought you played soccer. Yeah. 
I said real football, didn't I? And you said no. Okay, I got I got you on that one. All right, that's the end of section 5.5. Homework, oh, let's do vocabulary first. Vocabulary first. Sign of to you is? Absolutely, two sine u, cosine u. Cosine of two u is? Ooh, you can choose any one of three. The easiest one for me to remember is? Squared u minus sine squared u. There are two others that you can get by making substitution, but you can do that. What is sine u cosine v? Look it up, okay? <laughs> That's what y'all are doing anyway, all right? Sine u cosine v. Three eighty five, okay. Got it, okay. Okay, what is 1 minus cosine to you over 1 plus cosine to you? Sounds like a tangent to me, doesn't it? Got to go back a little further. Tangent squared u, very good, okay. What is sine of u over 2? Half angle formula. Plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine u divided by two. Okay, that sounds right, but I, oh, there, no? Where in the world is that? Oh, there it is, yeah, I missed it. Okay. And what do you say again? Plus or minus? The square root of one minus cosine u divided by two. Got it. Yep. Okay, and then what is cosine u minus cosine v? Got it. Super. All right. Homework. I mean, homework exercises here. Do any of the odds seven through thirteen? They're all at Calc Chat. Nine is at Calc View. Do any of the odds fifteen to nineteen? They're all at Calc Chat. Do any of the odds twenty-one to twenty-five? I mean, either twenty-one or twenty-three. They're both at Calc Chat. Twenty-one's at Calc View. Do twenty-five. It should be at Calc Chat. Either twenty or any of the odds twenty-seven to thirty-three. They should all be at Calc Chat. 27 is at Calc View. Do any of the odds 35 to 39, they should all be at Calc Chat. 37 is at Calc View. Do either 41 or 43 or both, they're both at Calc Chat. 41 is at Calc View. 45 or 47, both at Calc Chat. 45 is at Calc View. 49 or 51, they're both at Calc Chat. 49 is at Calc View. 53 or 55, both at Calc Chat. 53 is at Calc View. Either 57 or 59, they're both at Calc Chat. 61 or 63, 62. Both at Calc Chat, 63 is at Calc View. Uh, any of the odds, 65 to 69, they're all at Calc Chat, 65 is at Calc View. Uh, number 71 should be at Calc Chat. And that's one of the coolest pictures in the world, in my mind. Someone snapped it just perfectly. Did any of you know what he's doing right there? He's got your book open. Yes. Pedal to the metal. Yeah, he's, uh, it's what? He's breaking the sound barrier because what the sound barrier does, you know, sound travels at a certain speed and, it, and jets will, some jets will exceed that speed of sound. And what they do because their sound that's coming from them is pushing air molecules closer and closer together and as it does that and they approach that, then all the moisture molecules that are ahead of them get pushed into a little cloud in front of them and then when you break it, he bursts through the cloud. And that's just a neat picture, but that happens. If there's any moisture in the air, that happens every time they break the sound barrier. It just almost be worth it to be in the cockpit there to, to experience that if I wasn't throwing up. Okay, so, or something like that. All right, continuing. Uh, try number 73. It should be at Calc Chat. Uh, there's a true false number 75. It should be at Calc Chat. There's a problem concerning complementary angles at 77, and that should be at Calc Chat. Now, there's a chapter summary here that has a, summarizes a lot of the formulas and um, 
procedures and steps and things like this. It's open book test, but this would be a, probably a pretty good place to go to see it. Now, most of you have that. Do any of you not have the Chapter 5 test yet? I gave it out before spring break, so you wouldn't be mad at me for not giving you something to do over spring break. And so far, no one's thrown eggs on my cart, so I feel like I must have made you happy. Okay. So, anyone didn't get that? Okay. If you need a few more exercises to practice on, any of the odds on um, in 5.1, 1 or 3, there all these will be the odds will be at Calc Chat, not on the Calc View. Five, any of the odds 7 through 15 or 17. 5.2, any of the odds 19 to 25. 5.3, any of the odds 27 to 31, 33 to 41, and 43 to or 45. 5.4, either 47 or 49, 51, either 53 or 55, 57 or 59, and 61. 5.5, the ones we just did, 63, 65, 67, 69, any of the odd, either 71 or 73, 75, 77, 79. And then there's two true false, 81, 83. All those should be at Calc Chat. And by the way, 85 is a think about it problem. You can think about doing it if you'd like. All right, the chapter five test. Now, this is a little different. The answers in the back give the answers for all of the problems. Not, or they used to. I think they still do. Not just the odds. But Calc Chat still just does the tutorial help and work out solutions for the odds. You can do either one or three, any of the odds five to nine, 11. 13 or 15, 17, 19, or 21. Okay. And then there's, I know y'all wanted to do the proofs of those uh, uh, doubling or some form and different formula. Here they are. Uh, you can look at those if you'd like. There's a problem solving section if you want to do some more of those. And that moves us on then to chapter six, which is additional topics in trigonometry. What an, oh, wait, 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 wait. I forgot to show you the answers here. You can write the double angle formula to re use the double angle formula, rewrite projectile uh, motion model as follows. Uh, what they did here, they took what they had, injected a two up here and a two down here. That made a one of this, one of 32, and the two sine theta cosine theta is sine of two theta. So that's exactly what we got. And then the B part said, uh, with that new model, which they wrote again, which is really helpful, uh, they put 200 in for R, 80 in for your velocity, initial velocity, and they came up with 200 equal 200 sine 2 theta, which is exactly what we got, which is 1 is equal to sine 2 theta, make 2 theta equal to pi halves. We're only going to take angles ahead of us. And then uh, we will divide that by two and get pi fourths. And talking of place kickers, and this is just totally worthless, we had a guy on our, I went to a very small high school in Georgia, so anyone who wanted to could play football. And I did go out for it, and we had this one guy, he was absolutely nuts. But he could kick two balls through the uh, goalpost at the same time. Of course, he bounced on his backside a few times after he did it, but he could do it. And he did it. And that was the crazy thing. Never mind. All right. Uh, because the uh, because the angle pi force is 45 degrees, the player must kick the football. Angle of 45 degrees for it to travel 200 feet. Anything higher than that, it's not going to make 200 feet. Anything less than that, it won't make 200 feet. Anything greater than that, it goes up too high and comes down short. Anything less than that doesn't go up high enough, so it doesn't have enough range to make it to 200 feet. That's the optimum angle. All right, and that ends the show. Okay, so we'll discard that and go to 6 1. Maybe we'll go to 6 1 if PowerPoint will ever open. It's still trying, chasing five little dots across the page over and over again. There we go. And we'll go to current slide. 
All right. Additional topics in trigonometry. Okay. We'll start with the law of sines. Because if you think about it so far, trigonometry has dealt with basically right angles. But in real life, you quite often don't only have right angles. You have any kind of triangles with any kind of angles, uh, not always one with a right angle. And that's what law of sines and the law of cosines will do for you. Help you solve angles that aren't right angles, right triangles. So they'll use the law of sines to solve oblique triangles. That term oblique meaning not right. Okay. So an oblique triangle is a triangle with no uh, right angle in it. Okay. Now, if you're wondering what kind of symbols that we have here, uh, this stands for angle, angle, side, or angle, side, angle, okay? The law of sine work anytime you know two angles and one side. Anytime you know two angles and one side. We'll also use the law of sines to solve oblique triangles that are a side, another side, and the angle on the other side of that side. In other words, two sides like this and an angle down here. Okay. It will solve that. And we always call that side-side angle. We never call it angle-side-side. Side. Okay? Ever. Okay, so don't do it. Okay. Now, the next will be finding areas, areas of oblique triangles. We'll use a formula that seems very closely related to law of sines, and in some ways it is. And then finally, we'll use the law of sines to model and solve some real-life type problems. Okay. In the next section, we'll do law of cosines, and then we'll hit the other things we haven't done, like side, 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 and those kinds of things. Law of cosines will handle those. So, introduction. <clears throat> in this section and in the next section, we'll solve oblique triangles. Those are triangles that don't have right angles. Now, that may mean, like this triangle, that all the angles are acute. None of them right and none of them obtuse. But it will also apply to angles that, triangles that have an obtuse angle, okay, and then two very acute angles. That will work as well. But in standard notation, this is what we're going to use. I think we used it before, but we're going to use it again. So just to remind ourselves, we'll name, in these cases, we have been naming angles quite often Greek letters, but in these cases, we'll name them capital letters, A, B, and C, the angles. And it doesn't matter which one's the biggest and which is the smallest. Before, we always did the right angle as angle C. Now it doesn't matter, okay? So we'll have three angles, A, B, and C, with the opposite side to the angle being little a, little b, and little c, okay? So the opposite side to an angle would be the lowercase letter, that's the length of the side, and the uppercase letter is the measure of the angle. And it could be either degrees or radians. Okay. So, to solve an oblique triangle, you need to know three pieces of information. Okay? You've got to know at least one side. Okay? And after that, any other two measures of the triangle. Either the other two sides, that's going to be law of cosines. Two angles, that's going to be law of sides. Or one angle and one other side. That could be either law of cosines or sines, depending on which angle you know. Okay? So, you need three pieces of information. Always a side. And then two other pieces of information, either two angles on one side or one side and two angles. Okay? Or two sides. Two more sides. Okay? Now, the reason they didn't leave, put in there an angle, angle, angle triangle you can have the same angle, angle, triangle, whether it's this side or that size. So you can't solve it if you just do the three angles. That, that don't give you. You've got to have at least one side. Okay. So this breaks down into four cases. Okay. The first case, you know any two angles and one side. It doesn't matter which side. So that could be angle, angle, side, or angle, side, angle. Either one of those. Okay. They could have said side angle, angle, but that's the same as this, okay? So that's those two cases. 
If you know two sides and an angle opposite one of those two sides, then you can do then that's another situation. Uh, all right, we always say side side angle. If you know three sides, that's got to be law of cosine. So we're going to do that in the next session. If you know two sides and the equated angle, that also is going to be law of cosines. Okay? No way you can use law of sines with these two. Law of sines will work with these two if this will work. That's the one that we don't always know will work. So the first two cases here will be law of sines, and the last two cases, the next section, law of cosines. So don't worry about those yet. So here's what the law of sine said. Now, let's do the sort of the rationale first, and then we'll look at what it says. Here we have a triangle, an oblique triangle. None of these angles are right angles. All three of these are acute. Here, one is obtuse, and the other two are acute. Okay. Well. If you're dealing with <coughs> trying to calculate this, we're going to introduce another uh, component here, and that's the height of the triangle. Now, that the height is from the perpendicular, is the perpendicular to one of the three sides. You could have done the height to that side or the height to this side. They've just shown it here. It doesn't matter which one you choose. But here's the one they chose. Okay? Now, what we know already is that the sine of this angle is opposite over its hypotenuse, right? H over B. Right? Sine of A is equal to H over B. So let's write that down. The sine, whoops, let me get my pen back. Okay, sine of capital letter A is equal to H over B little b. Okay? Now, <clears throat> h is just a, a construct here. We don't know h. Never are going to be given h generally. Okay? So let's solve for h. That means h is equal to uh, b times the sine of capital A. By that? Okay. Now let's go over here to this end. Right? angle B. And let's look here. The sine of angle B is going to be the opposite side H. Because this, see, this is the perpendicular Y. Wow, that's the right angle there. The sine of B is going to be H over A. Right? By that, sine of capital B is equal to H over little a. Which we could then also write as solve for H would be H is equal to little a times the sine of capital B. But those are the same H's, aren't they? It's the same letter H. Same dotted line. Okay, so it's got to be the same. So what that tells us is that B sine A is equal to A sine B. Right? Now what you can do is divide both sides here. I'm going to do it the way they did, by sine B. Okay. And over here, the sine Bs will disappear, and you get this. But let's also just divide both sides by sine A. Okay. And now the sines A's will go out here, and sine B's go out there. So what we have here is that B over sine b, little b over sine capital B, is equal to little a over sine of capital A. Okay? Now, if you chose these two, now the, the perpendicular line here, you could do the same thing with angle c and angle b, and you'd find out that b over sine b is equal to c over sine c. But we already knew that B over sine B is equal to uh, A over sine A, so now we know that all three of those relationships are true. This is the law of sines. That if you know any two angles and any one side, you can solve that triangle using the law of sines. Now you do use something else, but let's 
look and see if that works for a two-sided as well. This one says that the uh, side, okay, you have to do this. Here is your angle A here. That's this obtuse angle here. But, this is the reference angle in the second quadrant, isn't it? Okay, and sine is, the sine is positive of, is in the second quadrant. And it's also positive in the third quadrant. And if you use the reference angle, same thing. So, the sine of this angle is also the sine of that angle, right? And sine of A is H over B, and sine of B is H over A. Yeah, still works, okay? And especially if you did the angles this way, it would be just like before, and, and you can sure come up with the, the same thing. So the law of sine works with acute triangles that are oblique, or obtuse triangles that are oblique, okay? Have an oblique angle or all acute angles. Now, the other way you could write this, because it really doesn't matter, you could write sine A over sine A is equal to sine B over B is equal to sine C over C. All, both of those completely equivalent expressions. Okay? Pretty easy thing to remember too, right? So, let's use it. Here's a triangle. Okay? Angle C is 102. Angle B is 29. Guess what? Not going to be a right triangle, is it? Okay. Find the remaining angle and the two sides that we don't know. Oh, and they did say B, little b is 28 feet. Now, they gave us three pieces of information. We don't know three. Which is going to be the easiest to figure? Any ideas? They're all pretty easy. But which is the easiest to figure? And you knew it before we ever mentioned the law of signs. Which one of these piece, three missing pieces could you have told me before we ever introduced law of signs? Angle A, of course. What is angle A? What do you do to get angle A? <laughs> Say again. <coughs> That's not, okay? Okay. Yeah, add these two together, and you get 131. He did, yeah. And then subtract it from 180. <laughs> I believe that's 49, isn't it? Okay, 49 degrees. That was easy. And that didn't use law of sine, law of cosine, anything. It just used the fact that every triangle has a sum. The angles of the three triangles, angles of the triangle, always add to 180 degrees, or pi halves if you're in radio mode. All right, so we've got that. Where do we go from there? Now you've got to use your law of signs. And my suggestion is always go with the Ratio you know. Okay? The ratio you know is B to sine B. You know that. And I don't care which you put on top or which you put on bottom. It doesn't really matter. Uh, to me, it seems easier to write little b on top. So 28 feet. Well, let's write down what it is. What is that? Law of signs. Using B. B over sine B capital B, is equal to law of sides. Remember, it's pretty easy. Really easy. Want to flip back a slide? There it is. Yeah, as uh, many as you want to give me. Little a over sine capital A, or little c over sine capital C. Yes, okay? And we know, the reason I put B first is because we know both of those. So I always like to start with the one we know. So that would be 28 
over the sine of 29 degrees. The degrees are important. Make sure you're in degree mode before you start any of these problems, if you're in degrees, problems in degree. So let's do the A first. Not, well, yeah, no problem. That's be little a over the sine of 49 degrees. Now, does anyone know what we call this structure right here? I mentioned that these are ratios. And if you have two ratios equal to each other, what do we call that? Proportion. Okay? Now, proportions are so easy to deal with. When I was in high school, I liked math. I did pretty well in math. But every now and then, I'd run into a problem I couldn't quite do. My dad was an engineer, ag engineer. He was a farmer. He wanted to be his own boss. Uh, and he, uh, if I took a problem to him, he could always figure it out. But somehow, he always managed to set up a proportion. And it made so much more sense than the convoluted way that the teacher was doing it. Uh, because you can just say, this is that, and that is that. And it made sense. Because this is what a proportion is. And anytime you have a proportion, they're so easy to solve because the product of the extremes is equal to the product of the ends. That's so, it's so true in a, uh, if you have a proportion, if you know it's true, you know those cost products are equal to each other. Okay? So I would set it up this way. A times the sine of 29 degrees is equal to 28 times the sine of 49 degrees. Okay? And then, since we're looking for A, divide both sides by sine of 29 degrees. Okay? And now it's just a matter of pull out your calculator and plug it in, plug it in. Okay? Wipe out these because that goes away. And it's 25 times the sine of 49. Be sure you're in degree mode. Don't get in radian mode and plug in degrees. You're going to get some wacko, wacko, wacko answers. So 28 times the sine of 49 divided by the sine of 29. And you've got your answer. Anyone get it? 23 point what? 43.6, is that what I heard? Okay. I'm going to round that. A is approximately equal to 44. Is that right? Do you say 43 or 40? The answer is 43.6. Okay. I'm going to round it to 44. Okay. And here's why. It's just my <clears throat> physics or science background. If you don't have but two significant digits here and here and here, well, here we made up. You have three here, but you only have two everywhere else. You can't get more than two significant digits out of this heaven. Now, the book I know gives you three or four or five, I don't know how many. They really can't do that. Uh, so the answer to me is approximately 44 feet. If I heard you right, yeah, they said... 43.59, you rounded to 44.6, I round it to 44. I'll take any of the answers, but really, in reality, if you only have two digits of precision in a problem, you can't get three digits or four digits out of the problem. You just can't do it. So, not in physics anyway. Maybe in math you can, but not in physics. Okay. Now, where would you go from there? We found A... And we found little a. Still got to do little c. How do we get that? Pythagorean, is that what you said? No, the same way. Oh, the same way. Good. I was hoping you didn't say Pythagorean. Why would Pythagorean not be a good answer? That only works with right triangles. You can't ever use Pythagorean theorem without a right triangle. Okay? So don't try it. Okay? But yeah, you're right the same way. And, in fact, so much the same way, do not use this A in your calculating C. That's a round-off, okay? If you work on you, use every digit on your computer, on your calculator. Don't round anything. But use the one you know, 
I always that's always my mantra, mantra I guess you would say 28 over the sine of 29 degrees is equal to now it's C over the sine of 102 okay now after you do enough of these you'll realize what you can do is write down the thing you don't know C and that's equal to the product of the thing you do know 28 times the sine of 102 okay divided by the other thing the other half of the thing you didn't know sine of 29 now the book does it slightly differently and you can certainly do it the way the book does too they get the same answer but they go straight to a formula like this or somehow like it and I guess they see it that way better to me that this shows it to me oh time out though before we do anything else when we got this A is equal to 44 feet, here's what I say. Look and see if this makes sense. We knew that 28 feet was off at 29 degrees, and we calculated this to be 49 degrees, so this A has to be larger than that. Because the smallest angle has the smallest opposite side, the biggest angle has the biggest opposite side, and the medium sized angle has the medium side. Okay. So, sure enough, 44 is greater than 28. At least you're in the right ballpark. Whether you got the right number, that doesn't, not guaranteed, but at least you're in the right ballpark. Okay, so what do we get for C? 28 times the sine of 102 divided by the sine of 29. We'll round it up to 57. Second? We'll round it up to 57. 57? C is approximately 57 feet. And that's longer than either of the other two. And sure enough, 102 was larger angle than either of the other two. So at least the relative sizes are right. Let's see what the actual is. Yep. Uh, I lost it now. You rounded the 57? Okay. Yeah, but wait. What did you get as your answer? 56.49. Yeah, but that rounds to 56. Because you look to the right, and yeah, so that's a 56. Okay. When you're rounding, uh, however many digits you're rounding to, uh, if you're rounding to two, go to, to the third digit, look to the right. If it, at the second digit, look to the right. If it's four or less, you drop it. Five or more, you bump, bump it up by one. So that would be 56. They point, point 0.49, fine if you wanted to, but I would, you just don't have that kind of precision. And sure enough, you have a checkpoint there. Now, I forgot to bring my watch in. How are we doing on time? Say again? Eight minutes ago? Okay. All right, let's see if we can get, oh, and we already checked. Oh, wait, they have the answer. Let's see how they did it. I'll show you a few subtle things they do differently. If you like it better, fine, go for it. The third angle is always the easiest thing to get first. It's 180 minus the other two angles, which is just what we did, 49 degrees. Okay. Now, as long as you're confident that you did the subtraction right, you can use that angle next. And this is the law of signs written in that form. You could have flipped everything over. It still would have been work. You can't just flip one or two. You got to flip all three if you're going to flip. Okay. Uh, and using B equal 28, they went straight for this. And this is what they do. And it's fine. It's the same way. They say the thing you're looking for, whether it's the angle or the side, put that on this side. The ratio that you know here and the sign of, if this was the sign of A, you put A here. If this was A, you put the sign of A there. If you want to do it that way, it's perfectly fine. That's how they do it. Uh, it works. Okay? And when you plug that in, you get 44. Okay, no, they got 44.59, but 43.59, but to me, that's 44. Okay? Now, doing the other way, again, they do a little c is equal to the ratio you know times the sine of the same angle that was. 
corresponding angle. Okay? And that's going to be 28 over sine 28, to, I mean 29, times sine 1 and 2, which is exactly what we did. They got 56.49, which to me is 56. 56 and a half, I would take. Okay? But I, okay. Now, <clears throat> They're going to the ambiguous case before they do example two. So let's do example two first. Woo. All right. Think we got time for it, don't we? Five more minutes. Okay. Here we have a pole that tilts. Shame on that. They put it in wrong. Okay. Uh, and it tips 8 degrees, now mine probably looks a little more than that, 8 degrees from vertical. Okay, They either didn't put a guy wire in or they put it in too tight or something. Okay, Pole tilts toward the sun now at an angle 8 degrees from the vertical. Cast a 22 foot shadow. So this is 22 feet. Okay, Tilting straight toward the sun, remember. Uh, the angle of elevation from the tip of the shadow, so you're standing here and you're looking at the top of the pole here, and that angle of elevation is 43 degrees. Weird problem. How tall is the pole? So we're looking for this. Now, you can name and number, uh, name the angles if you want to, if that's helpful to you or whatever however you want to do it, okay? But this is what you're looking for. And uh, how tall is the pole? What you want to call it? P or T or what? Do you have a preference? Huh? T or P? T. T, okay. So we'll call that T, okay? Now, <clears throat> We do not know, but this or that, or do we? Is there anything else we know? Huh? Okay, what? Well, you know this little angle here, but that's not part of the triangle, is it? I mean, it's part of the triangle. But what, is, what does this tell us? Ninety-eight degrees is this angle here, so this is ninety-eight degrees because vertical would be ninety. This is eight degrees beyond vertical, so that's ninety-eight degrees. Ha! We've got two angles on a side. We can use what? Anytime you have two angles, you can use. Second. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you can get the other angle, the one up here. And that's not, this 8 degrees is this one down here. So I'm going to put it down here so it's not confusing, as confusing. Okay. Okay. What is this angle here then? Thirty-nine degrees. Okay, because ninety-eight and forty-three is one. No, 141, yep, and 39 would be 180. Perfect. Did we need that? We're interested in how tall the pole is. Why do we need that angle up there? Because to use the law of signs, you have to know a corresponding angle and opposite side. Now we've got the side opposite, the, only, the angle opposite, the only side we knew. So, what's our law of sines then? Second. Okay, you you put letters in. Okay, so what what letters did you assign to what? Okay, that's what we're looking for. T over the sine of forty three. Okay, I'll buy that is equal to. 22 over the sine of 39 degrees. Yeah, oh, goodness. I'm, everywhere I'm writing threes. This is an S, 
And that's the degree sign. Okay. So we have that t is equal to, the way the book does it, this ratio, 22 over sine 39 times the sine of 43. I don't particularly care for that, but that works. Okay. Pull out your calculator, punch in the numbers. 23.84, is that what you said? Feet, because that was in feet. You only got two significant digits anywhere here, so I would say that T is approximately 24 feet. Okay? The book, I know, gives more than that, but I would say 24. And that's about, I would say, normal for most power poles. Okay? That means probably the pole was... About 30, well, maybe not 36 feet. They probably buried it at least 6 or 8 feet, maybe 10. So that was a pretty long pole. All right, how'd they get it? Yeah, they got it close. Okay, there is a checkpoint. Be sure to do the checkpoint. All right, we'll start next time with the ambiguous case. So that will be top of page. Um, but before you go, I know you don't want to go to the weekend without having some more homework exercises. So, and we got sort of, well, there. Do either five or seven. You can do both of those. They're both at Calc Chat. Any of the odds, nine to 21, they're all at Calc Chat. 11's at Calc View. Um, And you can hold off the others until we do the ambiguous case. Okay, good deal. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, did you not get it? Okay. I thought I asked that last time, maybe a little before you came in or so. Okay, that's the Chapter 5 test. Name test 3 is here. Getting warmer. There it is. All right, glad to. Have a good weekend. All right, thank you. You too. You too. Okay.